Previously on Chew, a massive bird flu pandemic not only resulted in all chicken being banned in the United States, but also the expansion of the Food and Drug Administration into a law enforcement agency. Enter Philadelphia police detective Tony Chew. Chew is a unique individual called a SIBOpath, someone who has the ability to discern the history of any consumed product, with the lone exception being beets. This has obviously hampered Chu's ability to enjoy much of anything in his diet, as any bite literally educates them as to how the sausage is being made. Still, Chu is an ideal candidate for the Food and Drug Administration, especially after his partner John Colby is the victim of a serial killer operating out of a chicken speakeasy and hitting Colby with a meat cleaver to his face, which has resulted in Detective Colby being put into a coma. At the FDA, Chu is partnered with another SIBOpath named Mason Savoy and tasked with finding out who killed FDA agent Evan Pepper. It's eventually discovered that Savoy is the one who killed Pepper as he's working for a group attempting to prove a conspiracy behind the bird flu. Chu turns down Savoy's offer to become a partner with him, which results in the turncoat stealing Chu's ear to use as a tracking agent upon consumption. That doesn't mean Agent Chu is in eternal torment, though, as he's fallen for a food critic named Amelia Mintz, who is a Sabo scribe nerd a person with the ability to basically translate the meals they eat via their text. This has allowed Tony to actually enjoy a meal without immediately learning its genetic history. Now on top of that, Chu is also going to be reunited with his partner, John Colby, and he's going to set out to hopefully capture Mason Savoy and maybe even prove this whole conspiracy thing along the way. This is Chu Volume 2 International Flavor. John Colby is out of a coma after receiving cybernetic implants to repair the cleaver wound in his face in exchange for joining the FDA, where he is immediately reunited with Tony. And while the two do give the illusion that they're still at each other's throats, in reality they've managed to bond. However, none of this really matters to FDA Captain Mike Appleby, who's still royally miffed about what's happened with Agent Savoy, so he keeps putting Tony and John on assignments where Tony must consume fecal matter in order to discern genetic history. Thankfully, Detective Colby's new implants allow him to just merely scan the substance and cross-reference this with various police documents. Or in other words, he manages to completely spare Tony from having to partake in a literal poo-poo platter. And sparing me from vomiting. Seriously, I got like really bad dry heaves reading this section of the book. The two FDA agents tracked down a group of bank robbers looking to fund a chicken smuggling ring from the island of Yamapulu. However, when Tony attempts to taste a soup made from their said product, it turns out to not be chicken, but rather some type of weird plant. Thankfully, Tony manages to have an inn for the tiny island located in Micronesia. His brother Chow Chu just recently accepted an offer to become head chef at a small resort. Chow Chu was a celebrity chef who specialized in chicken dishes, who tried to tough it out through the pandemic only to have an on-air meltdown, as it turns out, frog legs are not an exact substitute for poultry. Unfortunately, Tony wound up arresting his brother Chow after he fell into a black market chicken speakeasy. Thankfully, Yamapalu has no chicken ban, so Chow can apply his trade legally at that swanky resort. The two Chu brothers arrive on the island, unaware that they are being tailed by a USDA agent named Lin Sai Wu. Tony and Chow are soon separated, and the elder brother, Chow, winds up discovering that his kitchen is actually chicken-free. Instead, now there's just this very weird-looking plant. Meanwhile, a trussed-up Agent Wu goes after Tony on the elevator, inadvertently knocking out a elderly bystander in the process. She wants to know why exactly the FDA is horning in on her collar, and Tony tries to explain that he's on Yabapalu off the books, but it takes him mentioning the plant to actually settle Agent Wu down. She promises to give up information on this plant later as they meet in the hotel bar. Unfortunately, arriving back at her base of operations and greeting her cybernetically enhanced surveillance rat Jellybean, Agent Wu is jumped by a man sporting vampire fangs who chokeslams her out of a window to her death. The vampire-like man then proceeds to devour Jellybean. 
I'm sad now. Given that there are witnesses who saw Tony with Agent Wu, the police wind up bringing him in for questioning. Back with Chow Chu, the resort owner and governor of Yamapalu explains that chicken was banned last week as his people have discovered the Galsaberry, the perfect chicken substitute. To prove his point, they, the governor and his henchmen, begin cramming the berry down Chow's throat. Now it's said that the Galsaberry tastes kind of like chicken when consumed raw, but exactly like chicken when consumed cooked. So I guess that means the raw form tastes like raw chicken, which doesn't taste very good. Anyway, the governor of Yamapalu has actually now banned chicken to try to use the gulsa berry so he can drive up demand. And to do so, he's actually enlisted Amelia Mintz, that food critic I mentioned earlier, to spread the word with her many reviews. The police clear Tony just as he's about to get a swirly from his two muscle-bound cellmates. Tony begins fighting back, and the resulting blood splatter winds up splashing into his mouth, causing Tony to realize where a young man who had gone missing a few weeks earlier is now buried. However, there's still more information that's needed after the discovery of the corpse, so Tony is forced to take another chomp, and this leads them to a small isolated cabin in which their real quarry is located. A rooster wearing a luchador mask. This would be Poyo, a champion fighting Gamecock, who kind of winds up becoming the mascot for this series. Tony and the chief grab Poyo and leave, and upon returning to the station, Tony is allowed to investigate Agent Sue's body as well as several others, as it turns out there's a vampiric serial killer on this island. The sheriff isn't much of a help, though, as it turns out he just turns around and skips town carrying Poyo. However, his secretary, Sweets, is able to explain what the Galsaberry is to Tony, allow him to take a bite of one and discover some horrible secrets. He's not the only one, as Amelia Mintz has served her Galsaberry meal and is suddenly overwhelmed by feeling of dread and begins running off. Unfortunately, she gets knocked out by Yamapuli and Guardsmen. Back in the States, Captain Appleby is irate as he has more scat-based crimes in order for Chu and Colby to solve, and Chu's still out of town. A panicked Colby places a call to Tony, only to then discover that Tony has managed to piece some things together. However, it's still going to be a few days, so Colby's going to have to do what he needs to to delay the chief. So Colby does by sleeping with Captain Appleby. Eh. Tony learns of Amelia's presence on the island and realizes that all of these people in the morgue were killed by the same vampire guy who killed Agent Sue, and it seems that the governor of Yamapalu has some sort of ulterior motives by stockpiling these chefs. Tony and Sweets manage to locate the hidden operation of the governor and begin commandeering a Galsaberry truck to sneak inside. The governor is completely unaware of this, as he's just tasted a message from one of his new employees, a chef known as Fontanieros. Fontanieros is actually a cyberlocutor, who actually has the ability to communicate through their cooking. They're mute in real life, but upon eating their food, you learn what they're thinking and what they're trying to say. In fact, it's Fontanieros who prepared Amelia Mintz's meal, which warned her to what was going on on the island, after the governor arranged for Fontaneros' employment. Now it seems that Fontaneros' actual employers have enlisted someone to try to get him back. Tony manages to locate Chow, who really doesn't want to leave, thanks to the Galsaberry, as he can now finally relive his chicken-based glory days. Chow's mind is changed by Tony delivering a jaw-breaking thunderous bolo punch. It's then on to rescuing Amelia, who's still concerned about Fontanieros. Tony starts to head back into the compound, unaware that someone is training a sniper's rifle on him. It turns out these snipers are in the employ of Montero Industries, leading chicken and chicken substitute manufacturer, upset at the governor of Yamapalu for keeping the Galsaberry away from their research and poaching all their scientists. And also possibly for kidnapping Poyo, or so they believe. Added to that, the vampire has arrived, and he is taking no prisoners. The man sent to rescue Fontaneros is not an actual vampire. Rather, he is a Serbian Sibopath who fashioned a vampire look in terms of theatricality, especially since he's learned that he actually has an added ability due to being a Sibopath, which we'll get into a little bit later. Tony confronts both the vampire, who is also confronting the governor of Yamapolo. The vampire points out a past run with Savoy before the governor drops Tony with a lamp. The governor allows Fontaneros to leave and then takes Tony's gun to turn it on himself. The resulting blood splatter from the gunshot causes Tony to learn that the governor only had the best interests of Yamapalu in mind, as he was hoping to use the Galsaberry to boost the country's sagging economy. Tony then returns to Amelia and Chow. However, things aren't clearing out so rosy for Fontineros at all, as the vampire soon reveals that he has no intention of returning him to his past employers, because he already killed them. 
Now the vampire is going to kill Fontaineros as he's learned something about his coeopathic nature that seems no one else has. Yes, it turns out that coeopaths can also absorb the abilities of people they consume, so this has become the vampire's mission statement. I don't know about Mason Savoy, though, however it is implied that he's maybe working with the Montero Corporation. Tony then returns to the States in the Food and Drug Administration, where he's greeted by a much, much calmer Captain Appleby. Tony then places a call to Amelia and begins fumbling around trying to ask her out, and eventually manages to set up a date when she makes the offer. Amelia then turns to watering her plants, one of which is apparently a galsa berry seedling. And that concludes our look at Chew Volume 2 International Flavor. How was it? Well, on the plus side, I think there's some really nice artwork throughout this. Given the subject matter, it's not overly gory or overly crude or anything. It does a good job playing it just to right to the hilt. Also, I like the characterization in this. I like the fact that we get an expansion on Tonya's relationships with the outside world. Uh, in particular, at the end, it's nice to see him and Amelia kind of become a couple as Tony kind of felt a little bit like a stalker towards the end of Volume 1. And then there's, of course, the pacing throughout this. I don't think there's a lot of dead parts in this. I think it's pretty briskly paced. There's some good humor throughout all of this. It's got a nice dark edge to it. It's not, like I said, overly dark or overly crude, though there was that little bit at the beginning I talked about. Still, I think it's, overly, it's pretty well done. If there is a drawback, it's that there is kind of liberal use of a homophobic slur very early on in this book. And I kind of get the idea. John Colby uses it a bunch of times, and then... They're kind of doing the idea of closeted homosexuals, so they maybe aren't openly admitting it, but yeah, I just don't like the use of that term. It's the same thing if there are characters dropping N-bombs in this. Like, it just doesn't feel right to me, sorry. And uh, to be honest, I kind of would have liked a bit of an update on Mason Savoy. Like, he was a major character in the first volume, and now he's just barely mentioned at all. It would have been nice to at least get something of an implication. Like, I think there's a little, like I said, there's a little bit with the Montero Industries people, but other than that, nothing. It would have been nice to get a little bit more to that. Still, those are pretty minor quibbles overall. I am going to give Chew Volume 2 International Flavor an A. Although, again, I would also probably recommend you read Volume 1 before you jump to Volume 2. And with that, let's see what we'll be doing next time on the Random Trade Review. Hey guys, remember you can help support the channel at patreon.com forward slash sleepy time for cat productions. There you can request a trade to be put in the randomizer, aka the cardboard box. And as always, remember to like, comment, share, subscribe, and ring that notification bell.